Hello, my name is Sam Taylor and I'm a USMLE tutor uh, for Med School Coach. And this is question of the week. So the question uh, this week is a question about pathogenesis, which of the following most likely contributed to our current condition. And if we look at the answer choices here, we have uh, some toxic ingestion, maybe some microbiome. So perhaps we're looking at a nutrition or an infection case. So the case is a 35-year-old woman presents to the ER with excruciating back pain. She was taking a nap after work when she awoke to intense burning colicky pain on the left side of her back. She has a history of Crohn's disease and was recently treated with corticosteroids for a flare-up. For the past several weeks, however, her diarrhea and abdominal pain have been improving. She has no other medical conditions. Her vitals are significant for a heart rate of 102 and a blood pressure of 140 over 96. She is afebrile. Your analysis indicates microscopic hematuria and the findings below, which of the following most likely contributed to her current condition. So at this point, feel free to pause the video and think over your answer and whenever you're ready, plus play and uh, I'll get on with some of the answer explanations. All right, everyone, welcome back. So this question is great for a number of reasons. It, uh, it interrogates your knowledge of uh, physical diagnosis, your ability to recognize the symptoms of, um, of back pain, and um, it has a very detailed pathogenesis behind it that really deals with your knowledge of physiology, nutrition, GI, all of that. So um, before we get to the answer choices, let's talk a little bit about renal stones. And if you hadn't figured that out, this is indeed a renal stone. You can see here, these are the crystals, which you often see in a case of, of uh, nephrolithiasis, which is not another name for a kidney stone. Um, and the classical presentation is burning colicky flank pain radiating to the groin. So a lot of patients will say it's in their back they oftentimes won't spell it out in the question that it's flank pain, but colicky pain. Uh, and does anyone know why it's called colicky pain or why it's a colicky pain? The reason is similar to other um, problems in GI. So if you have an obstruction, for example, and the bowel is attempting to peristalsis against that obstruction, say in the case of intussusception, then you would get colicky pain every time the bowel tries to peristalsis, then you get the very intense pain. And so if you have an obstruction in the ureter, for example, then you would get colicky ureter pain because the ureter peristalsis to move urine into the bladder. And every time it peristalsis against that obstruction, it becomes very painful. So you might be thinking there's one other association to know about obstructions. And that association is infections. So whenever you have an, an obstruction, you get an infection behind the obstruction. So one example would be appendicitis. What's the obstruction there? It's a fecal in the uh, in the appendiceal opening. Um, if you have, an ex for example, um, a obstruction in the lungs, if you have a foreign body um, obstruction obstructing one of the uh, areas to the lungs, then you can get an abscess forming behind the obstruction. So in this case, if you have an obstruction in the ureter or more proximal in the kidney, you can get build up an infection behind that. And so what infection would that be? It'd be pyelonephritis. And how would you be able to tell that? Well, they would give you a patient with fever, perhaps nausea. They might give you white blood count. They would give you signs that the person is really infected, really sick. People with pylo are not happy. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about stones. So stones form for a number of reasons, um, but the very general pathology behind it is that uh, stones form from minerals and metabolites whenever they precipitate out of urine or whatever substance we're talking about. So if you remember from high school or college chemistry, the, you form precipitates when the concentration of your solute rises above its solubility or if the solubility changes. So in the context of a renal stone, what we say when the solubility changes, we're really interested in pH. That's the big thing that's gonna change solubility for us. So one of the things that really likes to form stones most is calcium. Calcium forms a number of stones. The reason being that it really likes to form strong ionic bonds with other things. If you can think about it, calcium has this two plus charge when it's in its ion form. So when it finds something that has a lot of negative charge, it holds on pretty tight. So that works to our advantage in things like bone when calcium finds phosphate in bone it really forms this really brittle or 
insoluble thing and we want that in bone, but we obviously don't want that in our urine. We want that to flow pretty smoothly. Um, so most commonly, uh, calcium binds with the metabolite oxalate in the urine. And this happens at a neutral pH under certain conditions where you either have too much calcium or too much oxalate. Basically, it's a concentration thing. Um, the other thing that uh, calcium can bind to is um, phosphate. And if you think of what happens in bone, using that for an example again, when the pH becomes very alkaline, calcium and phosphate can come together and form these uh, precipitates. Well, the same thing happens in the urine. If the, if the uh, pH rises, then you can start to form calcium phosphate stones. But calcium oxalate are much, much more common. Um, so um, the important thing to recognize about this diagnostically is that the calcium oxalate stones appear like an envelope. They, will, they might describe, or I think that they tend to appear more like those little fortune-telling toys in middle school that you might have seen, so kind of the, the shape demonstrated there. Um, and both calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate are radio-opaque. So what does that mean? That means that you can very easily see them on CT and X-ray. They're very dense. So another kind of stone um, is called the ammonium-magnesium phosphate stone, or also known as struvite. So struvite stones are pathognomonic for urease positive bacterial infections. Uh, what's probably one that should come to your mind very readily would be a proteus mirabilis. So you might ask yourself, okay, what's the, what's the, why do we care about urease? Well, if you think about the biochemistry behind it, what urease does is it converts urea to ammonia. And in the process, it tends to increase the pH, make it more basic. And so as I said earlier, um, most things, um, uh, a, a lot of things tend to precipitate out when you change the pH. So it turns out when you have urease positive organisms, one reason that they form stones is that they increase the pH. So that's how the struvite forms stones. These stones are very, very nasty. They're called staghorn uh, colliculi, and they form in the renal pelvis. So they form kind of in this big space, and they're called staghorn colliculi colliculi because they have the appearance of stag's horns. Um, so these things are really nasty and you have to actually remove them surgically if they're too big. Uh, the other treatment for these is that you treat the underlying infection. So if you have uh, urease producing organisms, you treat them with a, uh, the appropriate antibiotic. These are the second most common stones after calcium oxalate stones. Um, so we talked about things that tend to form in, in, in higher pH, but there are some things that form in lower pH as well. One of them is uric acid stones. So uric acid stones, um, when they're in their protonated form, for example, when there's a, already a ton of hydrogens floating around in the solution and they can't deprotonate themselves, then they can tend to precipitate and form stones. Um, uric acid stones also tend to form when the concentration of uric acid is very high. So this can happen for a few reasons. One of that is if you have decreased urine volume, and that would happen in the case of a person living in a very arid climate who's not getting enough hydration. Another case where this could happen is in increased urinary acid excretion. Um, so that would be in cases of gout or tumor lysis syndrome. Tumor lysis syndrome is, this, is this, a situation where you have very rapid cell turnover. And if you remember where uric acid comes from, it comes from the breakdown products of nucleotides. So if you have a lot of cellular turnover, for example, if you just gave a chemo drug and a bunch of person's uh, cancer cells lysed, um, then you're going to get a lot of those, uh, a lot of that uric acid making its way into the urine. So um, how do these stones look? Well, these stones are interesting in that they are um, radiolucent, so they're very hard to hard to see on x-ray, but if you do a urinalysis, you'll see that they look kind of rhomboid. And the, uh, the uh, struvite stones, by the way, tend to have a coffin lid appearance, as, as demonstrated there. Um, cysteine stones are very, very, very rare. Uh, you almost exclusively occur in the case of an autosomal recessive defect in transporters in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, the job of those transporters is to take certain amino acids out. Now, it just so happens that cysteine uh, tends to precipitate most readily of those amino acids, uh, in part owing to the, the ability to form disulfide bonds, which are very, very strong. So um, cysteine uh, forms these stones. These stones are pretty easy to pick out because they're hexagonal. 
they will be difficult to spot on x-ray and CT because they are also radiolucent. Okay, so with that primer on stones, we can return to the answer choices and begin eliminating things. So A, ingestion of a toxic substance. You might have been thinking uh, that this sounds a lot like uh, something like ethylene glycol or methanol. Um, and uh, you'd be correct. So if you ingest ethylene glycol, um, you can develop calcium oxalate stones in your urine. Why? Because the metabolism of ethylene glycol leads directly to oxalic acid. So you're increasing the concentration of oxalic acid in your serum, and then it gets filtered into the kidneys and finds its way into the urine where it forms these stone stones. So calcium oxalate stones are uh, formed from ethylene glycol. So what would you look for in ethylene glycol intoxication or exposure? Well, you'd be looking for two kinds of people. You'd be looking for perhaps alcoholics or um, you know, very, very down on their luck homeless people who have come upon ethylene glycol and started drinking it. Um, and so they would give an indication that the person was homeless or that they, were, they appeared disheveled or were a known alcoholic or something like that in the, in the stem. Uh, they definitely would not give this sort of misleading case about Crohn's. They wouldn't go into a recent flare-up. So all of this is kind of pushing you away from the, uh, the homeless person. The other kind of person that can ingest ethylene glycol is a child. So children who can't read, can't understand labels, or just want to disregard labels uh, would perhaps be drawn ethylene glycol because of its sweet taste, and they can also ingest ethylene glycol. So this woman is neither of those two things. So that's very unlikely. Increased production of uric acid, we discussed that. So we're looking for gout and tumor lysis syndrome. So this is, you know, there's no indication that the person has, um, you know, really bad pain in their foot. She's pretty young for that anyways. Um, and f further on, there's no indication that she has leukemia or recently went on to chemotherapy. So increased production of uric acid would not be appropriate either. Bacterial infection in the renal pelvis. So if you recall, this stone is the struvite stone, a urease positive bacterial infection leading to ammonia in the renal pelvis, causing precipitation of ammonia, magnesium, and phosphate stones. So is this a case of infection in the kidney. Well, she's afebrile, so that makes it a little less likely. Furthermore, they give this long history, once again, of Crohn's disease, recently treated with corticosteroids for a flare-up. So you might have thought, okay, corticosteroids, maybe she's immunosuppressed. But with these, is they would also give perhaps a white blood cell count showing that she has an elevated white blood cell count. Um, they might uh, give you some sign that she's in an active infection. So there's no indication of that so far, so we're less inclined to do this. We'll maybe put a dotted line through this one. Uh, D, impaired absorption of bile salts. Okay, well, why, 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 you know, what, what does that matter at all? Well, let's think about where things are absorbed. Um, well, bile salts are absorbed probably in the gut somewhere, right? They're made in the liver, they're excreted into the gut. And they go through, if you, if you recall from your anatomy, bile salts are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Because Crohn's disease really loves to affect the terminal ileum. Would you see this in ulcerative colitis? And the answer is no, because ulcerative colitis is a colitis, so it's confined to the colon. Um, but Crohn's fits really well for this. But what does bile salt have to do with calcium oxalate stones, which is what these appear to be with their envelope or uh, little, um, little uh, sort of fortune telling look design. So we'll leave that one for now. Let's go to E, impaired absorption of divalent cations. Okay, well, again, where, where does absorption happen? It happens in the gut. What are divalent cations? Oh, we think about iron can be divalent, calcium for sure. That's interesting, you know. Okay, magnesium. Well, wouldn't it really make sense that impaired absorption of calcium could lead to a stone? Usually, calcium forms stones, and these really look like calcium oxalate stones. Uh, what about magnesium? Well, magnesium can form, you know, a part of the struvite stone, so that would seem kind of protective if you can't absorb these. Uh, what about iron? Uh, what do we think about with iron? Usually, we think about hemochromatosis or we think about anemia. So now let's think about where these things are all absorbed. 
uh, whereas bile salts and were absorbed in the place where Crohn's loves to hit the terminal ileum. Uh, all of these guys are absorbed uh, further or more proximal, so the duodenum and the jejunum mainly. So what loves to hit the duodenum? Well, we think celiac disease. And in fact, what happens in celiac is if you get really bad damage to the duodenum, you can't absorb iron and you know, iron deficiency anemia. So this would really be a great answer for celiac disease in a patient coming in with iron deficiency anemia. So usually on the boards, they don't like to give away great answers for the questions on other questions. So we're between C and D, and really that just comes down to kind of recognizing that she doesn't appear to be infected grossly. And if you look at the urinalysis, these are not coffins, these are actually more of those little fortune tellers. So by a process of elimination, elimination, we know D. So let's go through the pathology or the pathophysiology behind why D is correct. So I've already kind of drawn this out a little bit, but it has to do with how your body handles fatty acids, bile acids, and calcium and oxalate. So in normal physiology, what happens is you have bile acids, they emulsify fats. And why is the emulsification important? Because the emulsification breaks up the fat droplets into little tiny missiles. And uh, that's great because it increases the surface area for enzymes to act upon it so we can more readily absorb it. So in Crohn's disease, what happens is you get this really uh, bad inflammation. I mean, you can, get it, you can get it all over, but it really loves to hit the terminal ileum. And it turns out that when bile acids come down after they've done their job up, up, up north, they tend to get recycled and picked up and used again. But if you damage this area of the bowel, you can no longer recycle your bile acids. And if you can't recycle your bile acids, then you can absorb fatty acids as well. And in essence, what that means is that you pass more fatty acids. So more fatty acids reach the colon because they're not getting absorbed further up. So this means that in this image right here, in the, in the junction here, we have an increase of fatty acids in Crohn's disease because there aren't enough bile acids recycled. So why is that important? Well, it turns out that some other things going on here are that calcium uh, binds to oxalate. And just like in the urine, when they form a stone, calcium and oxalate are pretty insoluble. So calcium and oxalate, they stay bound and then they're eventually excreted in, in a normal person. But in the case of Crohn's disease, when you have all these fatty acids, it turns out that just like how citrate can compete with oxalate to bind with calcium, fatty acids can also compete with oxalate to bind with calcium. And it turns out that fatty acids really, really like that situation. And so they'll hang on to that calcium. And you'll get fatty acid plus calcium complexes excreted. So that leaves oxalate all by its lonesome. And the oxalate can then just be absorbed. And when it gets absorbed, it gets into the blood. And when it gets in the blood, it has to get out. And it gets out through the urine. So you have an increased urine oxalate and that's why you get calcium oxalate stones with Crohn's disease. So I'd uh, like to thank the providers of this, this great photo. Um, this is a laboratory for continuing education and that was question of the week.